Hello and welcome to The Mastering Show. My name is Ian Shepherd. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the production advice website aimed at helping you get the best results recording, mixing and mastering your music. This week I have a guest on the show. His name is Aelco Grimm, a lecturer in music technology and recording and all kinds of other stuff at HKU University of Arts, Music and Technology in Utrecht. He runs a company called Grimm Audio and uh, we know each other through the Music Loudness Alliance, which is a group of engineers interested in uh, getting the word out about loudness normalization and talking to manufacturers and developers. In a minute, we're going to talk about the problems with loudness normalization. My guess is if you're listening to this, you already know about loudness normalization. Don't worry, if not, we'll, we'll bring you up to speed. But yeah, we're going to talk about the problems and some research that Elco has been doing with Tidal, which helps solve those problems. Elko, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Ian. I, I love being here in this podcast of yours. Great. Um, so you actually are part of the EBU committee that helped develop the loudness units, isn't that right? Are you head of the committee in Holland? Um, no, not really. We have a subcommittee in Holland where Richard van Everding and me, uh, we, we share equal levels of uh, responsibilities. <laughs> uh, okay. But the core group, which is uh, about 10 people that have done the majority of work at uh, EBU, um, P Loud, as it was called, I was a member of that, uh, as Richard was, uh, but our chairman there is Florian Kamer. Right. Okay, well, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second, but let's go back even further. I mean, how? what's your background? Were, are you a musician? Did, how did you get into recording and music technology? Yeah, I've been playing piano from, I think, when I was eight years old, uh, but I really got dragged into audio through my brother, who uh, became a guitar player player and I was already a bit interested in um, electronics and stuff and then I figured well maybe I can help him with uh, his electric guitar stuff so I started building his amplifiers and effect gear and so it, it, it wasn't very high end but it was a <laughs> it was very nice to work for him and it really got me started on it and then I went to the uh, university studying electronics and soon discovering that uh, I was more a music type of guy than real hardcore electronics. I finally found out that the thing that I really wanted to do is being more involved in music production. Yeah, after that, I did also a course that was developed especially for radio and television broadcasting engineers. And there I met with a girl who also attended that course. And through her, I was invited to come work at the Dutch Professional Audio Magazine. So I, I've been working at that magazine for nine years till the year 2000. And then I left and became a teacher at uh, HKU. And meanwhile, all the time, I've also been recording. In 97, I started my own recording company and made a recordings with um, folk music, uh, uh, very famous Fado singer. I recorded an album with that became platinum. Uh, mm. Did some recordings for classical music and also pop music. And my main thing there was to to aim for the highest possible sound quality. So what we did actually is we we designed and built uh, all my recording equipment ourselves. Because at the magazine, I measured and analyzed and tested and listened to lots of and lots of equipment. All the time, I had the impression that I could do better with my friends. So that's <laughs> so that's what we did. We built our own equipment for my recording company. And then nice. after a while, we had an analog to digital converter that sounded so much better than uh, the stuff that I I knew. So at a certain moment, I I just figured, well, maybe someone else would love to hear this too. <laughs> So that, then we made the decision to start Grim Audio. And that was Peter van Willenswaard who had been helping me to design and build uh, all this equipment. And uh, Guido Tent, who I also uh, know from uh, Audio and Technique, the, uh, the Hi-Fi magazine that I uh, wrote for in the 80s. He also joined and uh, Bruno Putzijs. So the four of us started Grim Audio and that was in 2003. And, uh, well, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> right, because you're producing, and now you have really high quality 
uh, speakers, monitors, right? Yeah, so we started the Grim Audio Company uh, with a discreetly built analog to digital converter by using our own um, Sigma Delta modulator uh, instead of uh, an off-the-shelf chip. We were able to to cut some corners and to do some stuff that uh, people that design a chip uh, do not have the freedom for. So we 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 got some freedom here that uh, offered us in the end about. At the time, I guess 15 to 20 decibel less distortion. Wow. And it's still uh, the analog to digital converter with the lowest distortion uh, because we could do th- stuff that you can't do in a chip. So, and I'd, I haven't heard your speakers yet. I would, I would love to. It sounds like the speakers that you've designed are less sensitive to room acoustics than maybe traditionally designed speakers. Is that right? That's right, yes. Uh, although below uh, 250 hertz, the speaker will behave similar to any other speaker. So you still have to do your acoustic stuff in the room. It's not uh, that uh, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay. But it, uh, what we, the feedback that we get is that indeed the speaker behaves much easier in a room. It's much more easy to place it. There's less problems with reflections and uh, the, the, the sound color in, in the room is more neutral than with other speakers. And I'm, I'm confident that's the result of our decision in the, in the, in the early stages to look at the acoustics of the, the cabinets and the effect of that first. Oh, it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm particularly curious to find out how you managed to do all of this research and, and kind of finance it and make it work with the business. But that would take an entire podcast. So we'll have to, <laughs> yes. you and I will have to talk about that in private sometime. But um, okay, so, and how did all of that lead into your work on the loudness committees? Ah, that's an interesting question. There's actually two answers to that. One is that that from the early beginning, I've been doing all kinds of things that were related to audio. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I said, I started with the guitar amps, very amateuristic anyway, but it, it's really got my interest to to hear the sound of an electric guitar and what an amp can do to that. And then uh, moving to high-end tube uh, uh, amplifiers and stuff, uh, it was fascinating to hear what the impact is that the electronics can have in the emotional experience you have in listening to music. Mm. But soon uh, I wanted to to be able to get that impact done properly into the professional audio world. It's like when you hear those beautiful recordings from the 50s. I mean, the Frank Sinatra's, the Jacques Brel, all those kinds mm-hmm. of recordings, the, 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 the Count Basie, big bands, etc. Mm-hmm. If you've heard that, at least I, once I heard that, I wanted to be able to, to get that back. I wanted to have that also in a digital world. Why would it just be something of the golden age of recording or so? The, so I wanted to learn what was causing that sound and what could be done about it. Of course, it was also great musicians, but apart from that, it was more. I figured if I could do that in the recording side of things, there would be many, many more people enjoying it than if I would just do it in, in, a, in a great amplifier for use at home, because that would just be one customer. But also, I, I love being involved uh, with music from, from my early age on, so... Uh, it made sense to, uh, to, to, to look at it from the whole chain. So mm-hmm. that's, that's really been part of my life all the time to be involved in every single stage of the audio reproduction from producing music, really uh, cooperating with the musicians to, to, to get the best out of their performance uh, via the recording uh, equipment, uh, the editing. I really love editing. Uh, editing classical music is the closest thing you can get to a, a director, uh, a, mm. con- a c- conductor, I should say, a conductor. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's wonderful. And, uh, and then uh, to be able to, to, to have a transparent as, 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 as possible speaker system so you you can be confident that the decisions you make on equalizing or compression that they are the right ones that you're not uh, compensating for 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 your own system or so and then if you then can offer that same experience to people at home that's also great as a company to to offer that kind of transparency 
But then there's there's a big part in the middle, which is the medium. If you have that extreme high quality in the recording uh, stage, in the mastering, and you want to achieve that experience also at home, then the medium becomes really part of that. Um, right, the, the distribution format. The, the distribution format. And it's not just the quality of the format itself, because, well, I love playing vinyl. I mean, those 50 recordings, they really sound great on vinyl. And I really wanted to have that analog feeling also available in digital. And that's what we found when we developed the 81, the first product that finally, and most probably also because we we were so good on our clocking circuitry, so the chatter was so low, that the difference between analog and digital became vanishingly low. And even preferring digital now because it's also so super transparent. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's that's part of the format of the the the, the technical aspects of let's say vinyl or CD or or, or twenty four bit files or whatever you have, and then there's the, the converters, of course, the chitter, anything uh, that matters there. But there's more, and that is, of course, if you are if you are now looking at a digital medium, there's MP3s. I mean MP3 or AAC or whatever subband codec. And well, they don't sound so transparent, but there's <laughs> there's hope, and we see lossless distribution from Tidal and from Quobus, and there will be likely more in the future. But that's only part of it. It's still the technical part. But what appeared to be one of the largest obstacles in the distribution is uh, the so-called loudness war, because of the fact that the the digital system. Uh, was limited by its peaks and uh, a louder sound was more appealing to some people than a softer sound. Uh, People tended to master as loud as possible. And the effect was that uh, as if you did not want to master aloud, well, uh, your artist or the A&R manager would come back to you and say, well, it's not loud enough, do this better, or we will uh, have another mastering engineer next time. And this is, of course, uh, not a technical issue with the, the, the chain. I mean, it's just 24 bits, uh, 16 bits on a CD. It's more than enough. Mm. Still, the, the, the medium became non-transparent because everybody was in this war and there was no escape possible. And that, that, so that's one side uh, why I was very much attracted to solving this problem. But the other side is that I just got got asked <laughs> because I, 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 in the Netherlands, I was well known from the magazine and I have some friends also in a sound with picture, with uh, television drama and movies and the television drama people came to me at a certain day. Uh, it was, I think also 2003, around the same year that we started Grim Audio. And I said, well, Ilko, can you please check what's going on here because there seems to be something changed in Hilversum at at the broadcasters. We used to be able to just predict how our sound would be like on air, but last couple of months something changed and it's really dramatically different. Mm -hmm. So what I then did, I, I, I checked with some friends I had in Hilversum and soon found out that the problem was that there was an advertiser uh, on a television uh, broadcast advertisement. His impression was that his ad was a little softer than someone else's. And then they went to a very famous acoustical consultant company here in the Netherlands. And they asked him, well, can you measure maybe if our advertisement is uh, equally loud as others? And the only standards that uh, these engineers had at the time was the PPM standard, the peak the analog peak standard is uh, mm-hmm. developed once for analog tape machines. And that mm-hmm. was the standard in broadcast. So they analyzed the, the peak levels and indeed their advertisement was a little softer than others. And uh, so they, they went to the broadcaster and it appeared that the engineers during broadcast were manually fader writing the advertisements because they were so loud. That was already the early 2000s when uh, peak limiters uh, were fueling this this loudness war in music and it also reached of course advertisements on uh, television radio was already lost territory (laughs) (laughs) 
So yeah, they they found out that this uh, this advertisement had been changed from the original level. And then the director of the broadcast station, they said, okay, no one uh, is allowed to touch advertisements anymore. Hmm. So the next day, uh, advertisements were 10 decibel louder than the program. The phone kept ringing and there was a big need for a solution. Hmm. So uh, what happened is they consulted with the radio friends and they said, well, you have this processor, just uh, hook it up and uh, everything will be fine. So that's what happened. They swapped their EMT limiter for, uh, I think it was an Orban Optimat yeah. or whatever style of radio processor for their television program. That was really bad. And then I, I organized a seminar here in the Netherlands with all the people involved in, in television broadcast. So the advertisers and the commercial mix engineers, but of course also the broadcast itself. And the directors of the of the drama series and all people I could could think of. So we had a couple of hundred people, I think, in the audience. Wow! A big panel discussion, and we had some examples of, of drama series where people were were sitting outside and, and having an emotional talk about somebody who died or so. And there were some little birds in the background, and every pause they had in, in the conversation. The birds would be equally loud as the, <laughs> as the conversation. So it, it was totally obvious that this was no solution at all. Maybe it works on radio where you have just a DJ and music, but it doesn't work at all on a television program. Mm-hmm. So um, in the end, it was agreed that a committee should look at a solution. And uh, that's what I did with uh, Richard van Everdingen. We uh, analyzed 50 uh, European television uh, stations to see on what average level they were broadcasting and what peak levels and all that. And that was for already pretty interesting uh, material. Uh, Mm -hmm. And when we published that for IBC, that was the same IBC that uh, EBUP Loud Group uh, was founded. And uh, two years later, we were done and we had the EBU R1 and a 2018 measure. Okay, so the the EBU group kind of grew out of that, that whole thing. Well, of course, the problem was already well known in, in, in the rest of Europe. But when I started this project with Richard, I met with the EBU people and said that we were uh, about to, to start all this and they were very much interested. And I, I think it has helped to convince uh, people during EBU meetings that now finally something has had to be done. It was kind of like a catalyst for process was already there, but it helped kickstart everything. Yes, yes. That's really interesting. So fast forwarding through to the future, I mean, so you, you were part of that and you've, you know, you, you joined the, the Music Loudness Alliance with um, Bob Ludwig and Florian and others since then. So you've kind of been involved in the issues ever since. And then just in the last year or two, is it that you've been working with Tidal? Um, yes, it's a good question. What started it? I, I, I think it went through MLA. MLA is just a group of friends. Uh, I think it's six people. And we have a, a, an email reflector. I just uh, chat a bit uh, in this little mailing list. Mm-hmm. And we wrote a, a document like a kind of recommendation to the streaming and at the time the download uh, companies like Apple, Google, etc. And this document was was about the best way to apply normalization to music, because in our opinion, uh, turning on normalization by default in all the devices that people use to listen to music will uh, remove the necessity to make your music sound as loud as possible, because then, uh, of course, everything will sound equally loud. Right. And, and then we will have all the possibilities again to use dynamics to stand out from from the competitors, mm-hmm. if we can call it competitors. I don't <laughs> I don't think it's it's a it's a game uh, making music and that there's a winner. <laughs> it's more like doing whatever you like to make something sound great. <laughs> well, and, yeah, that's the ideal, isn't it? But I guess I, I think there are some kind of some different opinions on that perspective maybe higher up the 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 chain well Um, there's a lot of fear definitely yeah yeah so we can take away the fear by making sure that everybody is analyzed in the same way 
Mm-hmm. By the way, what I found is that with the commercial advertisers in television, they really embraced loudness normalization as soon as it was released. They were the first to adopt it in the Netherlands because mm. finally they had time and, uh, well, they had the chance to make beautiful sound again mm-hmm. uh, because they hated it. It was just that if they w- made something sound less loud, then uh, the, the advertiser would probably complain. Although for some advertisements, a nice, sweet atmosphere does a much better job than a than an aggressive voice yeah so, you, you don't you don't want a hu- you don't want loudness maxed out on everything i mean that's that's right and that, that's the big thing so I mean, let's i'll just take the opportunity to do a brief tangent for anybody listening who I'm, I'm guessing most people are up to speed on the loudness war and normalization but you know really briefly the idea of normalization is that uh well the number one source of complaints from listeners listeners to tv and radio and users of mobile devices just in general, is loudness related, and in particular, sudden changes in loudness. Nobody likes listening to a playlist on shuffle and suddenly having a song that they can't hear or another one that just kind of blasts them uh, and is uncomfortable to listen to. So there's a, there's a big uh, motivation there for broadcasters and streaming organisations and people who make music players to to solve that problem. So the way that they do it is they use normalization, which is to measure the loudness of the music somehow and try and even it out so that you get something that is more consistent and more pleasing. Let's get back to Tidal. So we had the MLA and we were discussing all the developments that we saw online and in the news, etc. And after we published the document, we, of course, uh, tried to push wherever possible in our relations that we had at Apple and at uh, Spotify and also at Tidal. And then Thomas Lund, who is a member of the MLA, he uh, had a real good contact at Tidal. And he in- invited him and he, he also visited them to start analyzing their full catalog with the international standard for loudness uh, measurement, which is the ITU BS 1770 standard, which also forms the basis of EBU R1 and 28. Actually, when the EBU P loud group started, that that coincided almost with the release of the BS 1770 standard. So we figured, okay, now there is a measurement standard. Let's make a a broadcast recommendation out of that. That's that's what fueled uh, the start of and and the the development of uh, R1 and 28. Mm-hmm. Which is which is loudness units, right? LUFS or that's less. right. That's uh, that's the BS seventeen seventy standard. So it's been set, I think, in two thousand six or seven. That's when it really started. So I got this wrong when I spoke about it at the AES last week. I said you analysed four point two million songs, but you analysed four point two million albums in the title catalogue, right? That's right. But I have to really uh, give the kudos to to Thomas Lund for this, because what happened is that Thomas went to Tidal and convinced them to use the BS 1770 to analyze their catalog. And so they did. And so they had a database with the analysis of all songs of 4.2 million albums. And at the moment, there is even more albums that at the time, that's about a year ago, there were 4.2 million albums. Through Thomas, I got in contact with his contact at, uh, at Tidal. And I met him in Munich. We had an interesting discussion. And the goal was to press them to turn normalization on by default. Uh, they had the analysis. It was not yet available in their, uh, their apps, but they were working on that. But they were not sure if if they would turn it on by default. And as long as normalization is not turned on by default, it will not help to to, to end the loudness war. So this is is vital importance. Yeah, because that's the other part of the equation following on from what I said before. If everybody knows that the loudness is going to be managed so that things won't be suddenly too loud or too quiet and that there's no particular benefit in making your commercial or whatever it is super loud to begin with because it'll just get turned down, at that point, everybody can kind of relax. It's like you said, suddenly we have the freedom to do what is musically right for the material to get the best possible emotional response, the best possible 
feel, the best possible sound, everything to be ideal in the confidence that the loudness is going to be sensible at the end of the day. So, I mean, that's one of the great benefits of loudness normalization. But like you say, in order for that to be true, we have to be confident that it's going to be on in at least the majority of the places that people listen to music. And kind of over the years, we've seen it, you know, Spotify, I think, did it first. Yes. Then Apple did it with their iTunes radio. Um, Tidal have done it. Um, YouTube is very important. Yes, of course. YouTube came in a couple of years ago. So now, I think apart from SoundCloud, the majority of the online platforms are using or have loudness normalization of one kind or another available, but it's not switched on by default everywhere. And yeah, okay, so Tidal... I mean, Tidal wanted to do that because it would give the best listening experience for their users, right? Yeah, well, I had this discussion at the time with, with my contact there. We've really been uh, cooperating uh, nicely. And, and, and it turned out that um, they hesitated to turn it on by default. And the reason was that uh, in the standard loudness normalization methods that people are using all tracks are analyzed the same way that's fine but then they're all also adjusted to the same target level and according to people at Tidal this would not really work for them because many of their customers listen to albums instead of just random shuffle playlists and in a random shuffle playlist it could make sense to uh, set them all to the same target level. But of course, if you would do that to an album, the whole inner logic, the, the differences between the louder and the softer songs of an album would get lost. Mm -hmm. A title, they care a lot about music and the artist. So they, they didn't feel right about that. Yeah, I mean, quality is one of their biggest selling points, isn't it? Definitely, yes. Although I have to say that uh, the same accounts also for Spotify. I don't underestimate all those people. They are in, in it all because they like music. Mm. And um, But, uh, well, Tidal was looking for a solution that would really work for them. I had a lot of Skype conversations with them, and uh, we agreed that I would do a big uh, survey on their database. So the, the database... Analysis was already done by them. They had all the loudness data. But then I would do some queries on that database to find out two things. One is, what is the uh, best target level to use on, on music in their catalog? Mm -hmm. uh, because it was oh, a bit unclear. At the time, Spotify was still at minus 11 loves. Apple had selected minus 16 loves. And uh, EBU was at minus 23, love. So, yeah, what to choose? It was a difficult question. Mm -hmm. um, the AES had written a recommendation that said, please stay within minus 16 and minus 20, loves. So, yeah, and we had, we had to accept that minus 23, at least, was a little low um, because there were problems and still are with uh, the, 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 the smartphones and MP3 players, etc., that are sold in Europe because the problem is that music has been masked so loud that if you have enough headroom on your smartphone and your headphone, then you can really damage your ears by listening all day long to 105 dB plus of acoustic sound pressure level. Mm -hmm. And the European committee was concerned about that. So I think it's already four years or so that uh, the devices have to comply to a new standard. That means that a pretty loud uh, sound, uh, which is minus 11 loves of noise, is not allowed to play louder than 100 dBA on, uh, on the headphones. And not just with the headphones that come with the device, but with any sold headphones that are used with smartphones. So there's, there's regulations there. And because of that, a minus 23 loves target level, like in use with uh, the television broadcast, is a little low in level. Uh, so the maximum level would be approximately uh, 88 dBA, which is fine at home, can be a little low uh, in a subway or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if this weren't the case, it would be a no-brainer. Just adopt minus 23 loves on all and everything, and television pro broadcasts and music playback and everything would be really nicely aligned. But because of the limitations of the European smartphones, uh, we need to have 
uh, a better solution, at least for the moment, because uh, this standard will be changed in a couple of years, that it will not be just a, a, a limitation of the volume control. There will be an automatic dose measurement that really analyzes the actual acoustic levels that you are projecting yourself to. So uh, that will change in a couple of years, but at the moment it's still a fixed limit. So at the moment, uh, minus 23 would be a problem. And broadcasters are looking for solutions to, to have a little bit of gain in the app. But the streaming services need uh, a different target level, probably. Mm. So that was my, my first question. What would be an appropriate target level for music streaming? And then the second question from Tidal was, what to do about albums? I mean, ideally, you would keep the relative levels uh, that the mastering engineer decided to have for the various tracks in an album. So there would be a, a ballad, which was not so loud, and then there would be the dance track and uh, or the hit song that was uh, louder than the, than the ballad. And that was all intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, so what to do about that? Um, how can we, can we, do, do we need to change from track normalization where all tracks are equally loud to album normalization whenever you uh, decide to listen to a, a, a shuffle mode uh, list uh, or, or whether you'll decide to listen to an album I, I, that, that were all questions that were raised by Tidal you have to know that this is a bit problematic for a streaming service to know in advance whether a listener will continue listening to the tracks of the same album once he has selected a song or whether he will uh, skip to another track and then uh, maybe just keep on shuffling. So uh, it's, it's not like putting a CD in your CD player and just listen to the full album. That Those days are slightly gone, not, not completely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there was, a, there was a, this question. There were two questions. And uh, so that's, that's when I started doing this research. And I mean, the research is is fascinating. Um, and obviously, we don't have time to talk about everything you found in the podcast here. Um, uh, luckily, it's all available online. And I do recommend anybody listening to this who's, I mean, even if you're not that interested in the topic of loudness normalization, in which case you probably aren't listening to this by this point, <laughs> but there's some fascinating kind of insights there into that that huge catalogue of music. Um, so I do recommend people take a look at that and we will put the link to that in the show notes at themasteringshow.com for anybody who wants to take a look. And I, I guess the other challenge we have is that you summarised all of that information really nicely um, in some some graphs. But of course, we can't show people graphs on, the, on a podcast either. So I think what it'd be good to do is kind of summarise some of the most interesting, some of the highlights, if you like, of that research that you found. Um, and one of those was, that interested me was the average loudness of all of those albums over that time period. How did that fall out? Yeah, it was quite dramatic, actually. Um, what we found is that there's a clear evidence of the loudness war. So in the last two decades, uh, we have uh, a peak in the distribution of uh, the loudness of the of the tracks uh, that you can see at minus eight laughs, which means that uh, there is many, many, many albums that have uh, tracks at minus eight laughs, and that's uh, minus eight integrated, right? So that's over the entire course of, of the, the album. No, of the track. Oh, okay, of the track. Okay, yeah. That's, so, so it's, not it's all quite bad. it's it's the track loudnesses and. Uh, uh, so minus eight as, as seems to have become the sweet point for many mastering engineers. And which but, is, I'm sorry, but that, that's the, that's the integrated loudness of the track, right? So even in the track, there might be stuff that goes up to minus six or even minus four at the loudest moments. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, but minus eight is a very flat sounding song because mm. if you compare it to the eighties and nineties, early nineties, it was around minus 14. So um, some tracks have been a bit louder than that, but on average it was minus, minus 14, minus 12, and sometimes even much softer. So mm -hmm. the loudest track on an album could be minus 16 loves, especially in the 80s. So this is real clear evidence of the impact that uh, the digital peak limit has had in the past two decades. It's 
like you are turning all the meat you have into sausages, <laughs> and which is a shame. I mean, I love sausages, really, but <laughs> a steak once in a while is, is nice too, or, or have a vegetarian food. I mean, the, to, to have a variety of different flavors, that's what makes life interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And am I right that you, uh, the research basically showed that something like 87% of all albums have a loudest song that is louder than the minus 14. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So if we uh, analyze all those 4.2 million albums and then take different analysis for the softest song on that album and the loudest song of that album, because of course, if you do album normalization, you would be interested in what's going to happen. Or if you're doing track normalization also, what's going to happen to the soft uh, songs. And then the loudest songs are, uh, well, we have the vast majority, indeed 87% of all albums that will stay uh, above minus 14 loves with the loudest track. And I looked at the, the, the remaining 13% and the majority of that was classical or jazz or 80s pop music where when the CD was introduced, they thought, okay, we finally have all the dynamics that we ever would dream of. And they mm -hmm. made use of that. Maybe it was a little over the top, but uh, at least it was very enjoyable for audiophiles. <laughs> <laughs> and how about the, the quietest um, songs? What were the statistics for those? Well, they, they were on average at least uh, so about three LU softer than the loudest songs, which means, and that was also for, for recent albums, which means that uh, if you would track normalize all the music and also when listening to a full album, uh, even very recent albums with uh, loud tracks at eight, minus eight or, or even higher, they would still sound different than intended by the mastering engineer because the soft songs would definitely be two, three LUs softer and maybe even more. So track normalization, even with the, the squashed albums, still does not seem to make sense. No, I think, did you say something? I think 98% of all the albums you analysed would have the, the internal dynamics of, of, of an album changed if you use track normalization, song by song normalization. Is that right? That's right. In, in, in fact, it's a, it was quite astonishing to find that 2% of 4.2 million albums actually have all their songs at equally loud level. I mean, come on, what's the story? <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of refreshing. I mean, that's a, that's a nice small percentage. Um, well, still, yeah. but I mean, 2% is still a lot of albums. But it is, it's, it's the vast, vast majority that at least have some varieties. And it's also interesting to me, it's not strictly related to the topic of normalization, but, you know, that, I think that's quite an interesting three or four LU, that's, that's equivalent to three or four dBs of difference yes, yes, between definitely. the quieter and the louder song. People might expect that to be, to be bigger. Um, but I think even, the, I mean, the, the biggest differences you found were something like 10 dBs, weren't they, between the, the loudest and the softest songs? Well, if you analyze 4.2 million albums, you will find some real interesting outliers. Uh, tw <laughs> 20 dB is no problem, you will find those. But uh, then it becomes a real small amount. So let's say if, if we look at the 2% uh, level on the top end of the, where there's no difference, if we take the other side of the, of the analysis, uh, of the distribution, then the other 2% point would be at, let's say, 12 dB or 12 LU difference between the loudest and the softest. Right. And that's the bit that you were interested in and that Tidal were interested in, right? Because the question then is, when if you have songs with that big of a difference, what does that do when people listen to it, when you listen to songs that have been normalized by the album or by the song? So with album normalization, you measure the loudest song and you adjust all of the songs on the album by the same amount so that that loudest song hits your target level. Whereas song by song or track normalization, all of the songs get evened out and that changes the artistic intent of the album. But then the question is, which are people going to prefer, right? Because you might imagine that, especially when people listen in noisy environments and all the rest of it, they would want quieter songs turned up. And I think you investigated that, didn't you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, if they listen to an album, well, uh, maybe they even t play the CD, then uh, they would take whatever uh, was there. 
And mm. if the mastering engineer would then have a 12 dB softer song, well, apparently that was intended and it's fine. And it's been like that, well, f- from from the early vinyl days. So now shuffle mode has become much more present. Everybody is, is, is just shuffling. The question becomes, would you still want to have that soft song sound soft? Because maybe you just want to have an equal loudness on everything and uh, play it in the background and that's it. Um, so these are important questions. And you just don't know. You have to test it and you have to, to ask subjects uh, what their impression is. So what I did is I assembled two shuffled playlists of various albums, but these albums were selected on the fact that the difference between their loudest and softest song was pretty big, was more than 6 LU. I mean, uh, if the difference is just 3 LU or 3 dB, many people don't even notice because uh, 2 dB is the just notable difference. So, well, 3 dB, well, hardly noticeable. Mm -hmm. But uh, I selected on purpose uh, a dozen albums where the difference was 6 LU or more. I shuffled those albums so you would hear the loudest song of that album and the softest song of an album and not adjacent or maybe by by coincidence because I randomized this. And then you would hear the next to the softest or the loudest song from other albums. Mm -hmm. And then I had indeed two types of normalization. One is track-based normalization where all tracks would sound equally loud. And the other one was the album-based normalization where I would align the loudest tracks of the album to each other and then set the softest track of the album to the relative loudness that they already have on the album. Uh, So if the softest track would be 6 dB lower than uh, the loudest track, it would also be 6 dB lower than all the uh, loud tracks uh, in the shuffle playlist. And uh, I had 38 subjects uh, evaluating these playlists. Of course, the difference was relatively obvious. So anybody who would start guessing what the difference was, because I didn't tell them, of course, what the difference was. Mm -hmm. They would soon find out that the difference was that soft songs are soft or not. But apart from that, the majority of the subjects, they just listened in their in their usual environment. Uh, It could be anything like listening at home or listening on on earbuds, uh, commuting or wherever. And they took notes. And uh, the interesting thing is that then more than 70% always preferred the album normalization, which means that if you have a soft song uh, that's intended to be soft on the album, they would prefer this song to be soft in the shuffled playlist too. And it sort of makes sense. I mean... If you listen to those songs, usually the, the voice is still at a normal level. Maybe he's not screaming, but uh, singing in a softer voice, but still it's a normal voice level that the singer is using. And the mastering engineer was very carefully aligning those levels with the other songs. And then if you would have that softer song with a softer voice, at the same loudness as the blasting uh, rock song, then it, it, it doesn't make sense emotionally. Yeah, it, it feels too loud because uh, I got a chance to play with the, the playlists as well. And that was exactly my experience. Um, I actually went into it. I mean, people might be surprised. I went into it with quite an open mind because, you know, I, I do think it would be annoying to, to be listening in shuffle mode and have a quiet song suddenly not be audible. But that wasn't my experience at all. Even though the album normalised playlist retained those differences in levels, it just sounded more musically comfortable, basically. Whereas listening to the one that was track normalised, there were definitely some songs that musically were obviously intended to be loud that didn't sound as loud as you might expect them to in the context of what had become before and after. It's interesting to to have that experience that when you track normalize everything the impression is that the tracks don't sound equally loud <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly and because of course the opposite applies as well which was that you would suddenly hear a song that was obviously intended to be quiet and it just sounded much too loud so yes yes it, the, the, the normalization sounds less effective when it's done on a track basis than when it's done on an album basis and that was i mean that wasn't just me you say that that was 70 percent 
of users. And then am I right that when you talked to the other 10% and explained the differences, they said that they would actually prefer to have the album normalized anyway. Is that right? Yeah, well, what happened is that uh, after uh, all the subjects uh, returned uh, the questionnaires, I, I contacted the people that preferred track normalization because I wanted to know uh, why they did so. Actually, I asked uh, the album normalization preferences people uh, the same question. And they returned the answer that they wanted to be in control of the volume themselves. Uh, so they would adjust the level if it felt too loud or too soft. So they actually liked uh, the level to be at a certain reference point and then set it to their own needs. So they were more active in a way. Some of the other people said, no, 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 no. I played this playlist super soft. So it's really background music, but I, I want the music to be there always. So they said, well, I just don't like soft songs or so. It's, and if there were soft songs, I want them to be equally loud as the loud ones. And then there was this small group that said, yeah, yeah, I, I just didn't know what I really preferred, but I think that for a playlist, this suits me better. And I said, okay, what if the effect would be that whenever loudness normalization is turned on by default, you can always turn it off, of course, but if it's turned on by default, all the tracks would always be normalized to equal loudnesses. So also, if you listen to a full album, and then they return, no, 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 no. You know, I don't listen to playlists at all. I just listen to albums. But uh, since you asked me to listen to this playlist and what I would prefer then, I figured that it would be better to have uh, all songs equally loud. But if, if I just tell you what I really like is that uh, I have the experience that was intended by the artists. And so another 8% of the people said no on second thought, if this is the de facto standard uh, that will always be there if you open an app or, or install an app, then I would prefer to have album normalization be turned on by default at first and maybe use track as, a, as an alternative in the settings or so. So that made at, at least 80% of my subjects to prefer album normalization so this is and this is the fascinating result and and this is where the, the the title of this episode comes from you know what we have when we're talking about track normalization is a problem with normalization in general you know yes it's desirable to reduce user complaints and so that we don't have to worry about loudness and can do what's artistically right for the music but if we're using track normalization there is a downside there's a problem which is that it messes up the internal dynamics of the albums. It changes the artistic intent of the artists. And that's a serious criticism that obviously Tidal have. And I, I think also Apple are concerned about that, that some of their users might not like that. But the, the great kind of conclusion from your research is that it's easy to solve that problem by using album normalization instead. And in that situation, you've got 80% of users are going to be happy with the results. And if they're not, they can turn off normalization. And the other interesting conclusion is that since almost 90% of all albums have a loudest song that is minus 14 LUFS or more, by choosing minus 14 as a, a reference level for the, for the loudest moments on albums, we can get effective normalization for well, almost 90% of Tidal's catalogue, anyway, of the, which we have to assume is, is that's, that's a pretty extensive uh, sample size. And so th that's the recommendation you went back to Tidal with, am I right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So I, um, I presented this at AES uh, last year, uh, or this year still, in, in Berlin. I also did it uh, two weeks ago in New York. Before I went to New York, I uh, I went to Tidal. I presented my my results also to the, the full personnel of the Oslo facility, and of course, before I all did all that presentation work, I sent them my uh, reports, and they were very much interested in it. And what I learned when I was at Tidal uh, last month is that. They have been working on implementing it already. So the current loudness normalization that you can turn on in the iOS app, if you if you go to the preferences and if you turn it on, it is album normalization always, also in shuffle mode. 
And they told me they will turn this on by default pretty soon. Uh, was promised uh, end of October or mid November, somewhere around this uh, this date. So probably now you're listening to this podcast, it's already there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, this is why I'm excited about it. And I mean, actually, you and I have been. Uh, sitting on our hands or biting our tongues for for weeks because obviously you you knew that this was the recommendation you were going to give to Tidal and you knew that they were likely you know they asked you to do the research so there's there's a good chance they were going to uh, take your advice follow your recommendations um and it's fantastic to now be able to kind of go public and talk about this because you know the hope then is that other streaming services will follow their example you know we've seen Spotify already uh reduce their loudness normalization level by 3 dB earlier this year to be more in line with YouTube and Tidal and Apple are a couple of dBs quieter. But, you know, that was a huge positive move. You know, I've noticed since that happened, more and more people asking about loudness normalization and how to optimize their music for the online streaming services. Um, I think that's, it's having a huge impact. Um, And my feeling is that maybe this could be uh, the tipping point for this whole issue and that may hopefully going forward, you know, the, the streaming services are going to standardize more and more. I, you know, if we could imagine a future where all of them were loudness normalized by default and we're using album normalization. Um, and if they even followed the AES recommendation and standardized with the minus 16 that Apple have, um, although actually already the title recommendation is kind of closer to that, isn't it? Because it's, it's using the loudest song at minus 14 yeah, and, that's right. Only 2% of albums have all of their songs at that level. So that means that within a normal album, you're going to get some some variation. So so quite possibly that minus 14 is kind of equivalent to the minus 16 already. Is that? that that's right. Uh, if you look at the um, the distribution, we, we should do a proper analysis on that, but it's not super important. But if I look at the distribution now, oh, I see that there's a, a big amount of albums that has a difference of two to four LU between the softest and the loudest tracks. That means that uh, the average loudness of the album will likely be lower than minus 14 and probably close to minus 16 loves. And that means that if we use the uh, AES recommendation for the full album, uh, the current implementation by Tidal will be spot on. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good news all round, really. I've, read over the years lots of criticisms of normalization people saying i don't want people to control the loudness of my music you know the decisions that i make and actually using album normalization means that that criticism has been answered because the decisions that you make when you're mastering um are retained even when people listen in shuffle mode yeah i mean I, personally i'm i'm really really positive about this and i hope it's going to move things further i mean i'm curious to find out what you think the, the next steps are. I mean, obviously, normalization is is still not perfect. Maybe you can quickly summarize some of the the challenges that we still have to to get the best possible results out of all of this. Well, like I said in the beginning, uh, one of the major problems that we still have is that for video and speech uh, content, minus fourteen loves is a bit high, and broadcasters know that, so they very much prefer to have a wider dynamic range uh, optional. Which means that uh, it would be great to see the Senelec uh, regulations from the EU to adopt this analysis to the uh, to the smartphones. Dose meter that that's that's instead of having one figure and assuming people are listening for eight hours, that means it actually analyzes the amount of time people actually listen to things at a particular loudness. Is that right? And do the regulation in that way so that it just limits their maximum exposure time. Am I right about that? Yes, that's right. So, so the, the, the smartphones would then do an actual uh, analysis of the amount of loudness that you are subjecting yourself subjecting to. Subjecting yourself to, right. And which means that the, the headroom of the device, that is already there. It's just uh, uh, limited uh, artificially by the regulations. Uh, it's just a matter of a software update and then all devices would have more headroom. And then more music and uh, also especially uh, television broadcasts, etc., or Netflix or whatever you watch on your smartphone would then be normalized together with the music. So that would be a, a very important improvement still. 
there are still some streaming services that need to become uh, aware of this. I'm thinking especially about uh, Google Play Music and uh, SoundCloud. There's a couple of others still. I had an interesting conversation at AES. Um, somebody from Facebook was talking to me about loud and normalization, which I thought was very positive. Um, it's great to hear that they're thinking about these issues. Well, of course, uh, once there's more kids on the block, the others don't want to become late. They, uh, it's just like sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Highly intelligent, charismatic yes, sheep, obviously. <laughs> yes, it's, it's very tough to be the first often. And I really applaud Spotify again and again for the fact that they took the risk and uh, they, they did it. Absolutely. I, I actually, so I, I was lucky enough to, to speak with Bob Ludwig at uh, the AES just recently, as you know, and uh, I started my presentation, which was about loudness normalization um, for him with, it's not really a joke, but I, I, I admitted that in 2009, I wrote a blog post saying that Spotify would end the loudness war and that with hindsight, maybe that was a little bit optimistic, but I actually do think, I mean, you're right, you know, they were the first streaming service to implement normalization by default. And more recently, they have made that decision to reduce the level by 3 dBs, which actually, you know, in terms of the possible backlash from users, um, is quite a courageous move. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, that wasn't kind of under pressure from anybody. They, you know, that's something that they, they noticed the issue and they decided to take action. Um, so yeah, I, you know, kudos to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, well, talking of possible things to do still in the future, uh, I think that Google and Apple, they face a bigger problem perhaps than, uh, for instance, Spotify and Tidal, because they also would need to normalize the full operating system of the phones. Uh, I mean, the Android phones and the iOS phones, of mm -hmm. course. Because then it would not just be Apple Music or Google Play Music, but all the sounds in the phone that need to be normalized. I know that Apple's taking this very serious, uh, but the task is a little bigger than with uh, a company like Spotify. Yeah, um, if, you, if you're only dealing with the output of one application, that's one level of challenge. But if you're taking a view on the output of all applications and some of those, well, those applications are written by third parties, you know, if they're going to regulate everything that appears in the app stores for Android and iOS, that is a much bigger task. Yes, and to that comes that, uh, for instance, if you would make a podcast app and you would be just open to any uploads, well, your contributors could do anything and it could be minus four loves. And so how could Apple possibly deal with that? Uh, so there are some pitfalls, and uh, but I'm confident they are taken care of at the moment uh, seriously. And I think that it will probably be a couple of years still before everything will be loudness normalized, but not much more. <laughs> okay, so 2009 was uh, eight years ago. Yeah, so, so I'm going to say it's going to be four or five years. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be safe. <laughs> Just to be on the safe side. But yeah, it's, uh, so oh, there was one other thing that I thought people might be interested in. You and I were talking about one of the other challenges is just the way that normalization reacts to different kinds of program content. Um, again, I think measuring the loudest thing and judging everything relative to that is the right way to go with music. But of course, one of the other challenges is speech versus music. And that's particularly relevant to YouTube, for example, where they have a wide range of material. You have TV programs as well as music and some stuff comes from films. Um, and that's just another challenge. I don't think that's a huge problem. I mean, I could, we can give um, maybe a useful rule of thumb to people who are listening who are interested in this, which is that typically you need music to be uh, normalized maybe three, possibly four dBs louder than speech if you're using a loudness meter. So if you measure the integrated loudness of the speech and you measure the integrated loudness of the music, you have something like three or four different dBs difference between those then they're going to sound natural. Obviously, of course, the best possible way is just to use your ears and choose what sounds right naturally. But I guess for a streaming platform, say, or for an operating system that is trying to normalize audio, the computer can't make a, a human decision about what sounds right. So maybe some kind of intelligent recognition would be the future of that, do you think? 
Yeah, you're right. I think that uh, it's indeed the most important thing to to judge it for yourself by ears. It, it very much depends on the type of music. Some type of music can be largeness normalized at the exact same level as speech hmm. and others, uh, other types not. Um, so it's an artistic decision in a way. But like you said, if you have a broadcaster or a podcaster or whatever, and you mix both speech only material and music only material, it can become a little bit more complicated. And that's also one of the reasons why the AES has this range in their recommendation from minus 16 to minus 20. Of course, many people say, okay, that means everybody will go for the loudest and and choose minus 16. But the smarter users will know that they will need a range like that. It's different with television broadcast because the whole program It consists of speech and background sounds and music and everything. And and then you have a whole program of a certain length uh, or it's mainly speech based like interviews and news, etc. But the problem is is smaller than with a totally music oriented uh, type of program like you see on radio, for instance. Also on radio, people know that uh, the voice needs to be processed uh, in a different way than the music to have it sound at equal levels. And so this is not new and it, we will always need uh, the ears to make the final judgments. But on average, you could say that it makes sense to keep in mind that uh, speech only content should be a little less loud on your meter uh, your love meter than the music only content. If you uh, integrate the whole music piece and the whole speech only piece, uh, but that, that's the rules of stump, and uh, we have to find out in practice what works best in which situation. And to my opinion, it's still it's it's the details. It's the smaller details that will be important after the change to loudness normalization. Yeah, so let's first do the big uh, step and have it turned on by default on all possible streaming platforms. And then we can refine it in all possible ways to make it an even better experience. Yeah, absolutely. That that was my thinking as well. I think there's some research that shows in terms of kind of users perceiving that there's a problem, uh, the, the level differences need to be of the order of 3 dBs before most users really pay attention in terms of the difference between speech and music, chances are we're in the right ballpark already. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you that the benefits of having normalization enabled everywhere and using album style normalization where everything is referenced to the loudest moments and retains the artistic decisions everywhere, we've kind of solved a huge number of problems by by taking that step. And th- from then on, yes, absolutely, everything can be refined to get better and better results. Um, are more and more pleasing. And I guess people will still try and, you know, cheat the system in one way or another going forward as well. But all of that stuff can be dealt with as as time goes on. And for the time being, yeah, the the really positive thing is just that this technology is here, it works, it has results that people like and approve of, and that people are paying attention. You know, that's the thing, as I said, that I find really positive is that more and more people are talking about these issues and becoming aware and thinking about it. So even if they, you know, make decisions that I still think, I I noticed recently that I think it's the latest Taylor Swift album is just as squashed as her her previous releases, but the uploads to YouTube seem to have been normalized to minus 16. So that ironically means that it was mastered louder than necessary, but because YouTube doesn't turn quiet songs up, it's actually a couple of dBs quieter than some of the stuff that it's competing with in inverted commas there's a strange kind of irony there that somebody is doing the right thing if you like and it's not having the result that they want so i guess there's going to be a learning curve for everybody involved with this oh definitely and i think it's also fun to 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 have such a major change in our industry because we have to we can learn new tricks and that's fun. It's always fun to do to learn something new. <laughs> now, that's an angle I hadn't considered yet. I'm always looking for positive ways to to present this. So, uh, yeah, a, a blog post: loudness normalization is fun. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> 
Oh, I'd be fascinated to see whether people who've got to the end of this episode uh, agree with us on that <laughs> or not. <laughs> anyway, well, well, listen, Elko, thanks so much for, well, thank you for doing the research. Thank you for your work as part of the original P Loud committee and with the EBU and, you know, for reaching out to groups like uh, Tidal um, and the other streaming organizations. Thanks for your help. Uh, you helped me get the, the paper that we presented at AES on PSR, peak to short term loudness that my dynameter plugin measures. Uh, you helped me get that together. That was, you, I think you're just doing great work in this field and in general. And I'm imagining when I hear your speakers, I'll think you're doing great work in that field as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks for that. And you know, thanks for, for your time on the podcast today. I really enjoyed it. I hope everybody listening has as well. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for having me and uh, for all your praise. And I, I indeed hope that the listeners have enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. So looking forward to, uh, to see you again, Ian. Absolutely. We'll have to figure out when that's going to be. Um, so everybody else, please head over to themasteringshow.com to get the link for Elko's research. As I say, there's all kinds of interesting insights in there into loudness in general and what he found when he analyzed that, that huge tidal catalog um, we'll put other links that might be relevant to you there as well you can sign up for the hot list to get uh, notifications of future episodes anything else that might be going on in the world of the mastering show uh, thanks to john tidy for editing and mixing the podcast as always thanks to kaylee law for letting us use his music and thanks to you for listening One of the problems of that design was that it was very sensitive to jitter, uh, but that was a blessing in disguise because um, that meant that we had to be really precise uh, on our clock circuitry. So we developed our own jitter analyzer to make the analog to digital converter possible. Okay, so just briefly, I'll interject if anybody listening hasn't well, I don't think we've talked about jitter yet. Wow, there's a there's a nerdy thing that we haven't discussed on this podcast yet. <laughs> so jit, jitter is tiny little variations in the the timing of the clock pulse, right? Either the master clock or caused by errors, noise in transmission. So basically, the the sampling points are become less accurate the greater the jitter is, and that introduces a distortion into the sound. So so ideally, you want a completely jitter free clock, which I guess is not theoretically possible. So, sorry, when I interrupted, you were saying you're, the, the original converter was very sensitive to that, but it, that meant you could do lots of testing to figure out solutions? That's right, because it's so sensitive. It's also a measurement system in itself. So as soon as you get the right noise figures out of that AD1, um, you know, okay, that means that uh, we really uh, nailed it uh, jitter-wise. Um, but apart from that, we also developed our own jitter analyzer. We, we in, initially we had access to a jitter analyzer of a company where some friends of ours worked. This was an analyzer that cost it, uh, I think it was 150,000 guilders or so at the time uh, when they bought it. Uh, so extremely expensive uh, piece of equipment. We learned a lot using that uh, device and then we were able to develop our own system that when it just came to analyzing that single clock frequency that we were interested in, uh, it even performed better than that super expensive instrument. Mm. Um, so yeah, we learned a lot. It was it was a very interesting time. It's, I think that's a, a kind of a it's a bit of a tangent, but I think it's a, a a real that's a kind of rule. I would say. I mean, I ended up knowing quite a lot about uh, how uh, PCs work just because I had my own computers and then they would break and I would need to mend them. So I had to figure that stuff out. And, the, you know, the same all the way through my career. A lot of the knowledge that I have is just because of trying to do stuff and either finding problems with what was already there or a problem with the particular setup that you had. I mean, I think it's just a great, you know, for anybody listening to this, it, there's a lot of benefit from reading educational stuff and taking courses and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, there's, there's no, uh, there's nothing better than just, rolling your sleeves up and getting getting involved yeah um, but it's pretty impressive that you like so, so that's that's a, a really high quality hd and d2a converter really high quality speakers amazing measuring equipment all of this stuff that you develop and you're kind of doing it all yourself that's right yeah yeah we if i look at the speaker for for a minute the the, the problem with a, a speaker is that it's 
it's not just the speaker that you're hearing. You are you you hear the interaction with the acoustics. Mm-hmm. Um, but apart from that, you have to deal with so many aspects, uh, and they're all in a way compromises because, for instance, the driver manufacturer needs to uh, make sure that the system is in balance in a certain way because it has to function well in a passive system. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for instance, if you have a tweeter, uh, what you really want is a wide dispersion. So what what really helps there is to have a small constant directivity horn mounted in front of the tweeter. So as soon as the tweeter itself starts to 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 beam the sound more forward, the horn will will break it up a little bit and and radiate it more to the sides. And that's what mm-hmm. you actually want. You want to have a real good off-axis response. But with a, a passive system, the effect, of course, is a roll-off of the top end because the energy that would normally only go to the front will now be dispersed in, in, in more directions. Okay. Yep. Now, with a passive system, well, that you have to live with it. But uh, we decided from the start that in our system we would uh, use digital signal processing to give us more freedom again, the freedom to select a tweeter like this, which would you would maybe not do if it was, was a completely analog system. But the advantage was that we could have its virtues and at the same time um, control the disadvantages of that design by adding gen- uh, a little equalizing uh, in a smart way, um, manually, not just automatically, uh, what you can, can see sometimes happening when people decide to use DSP and speaker. We all do it manually and then gradually make this system sound both linear in the direct sound and uh, good off axis. Um, so when we decided to, to use DSP in the speaker, it's already implication that we had to design the whole signal chain. Because if you want to have DSP control and speaker, you need to have the amplifiers there. You need to have the digital to analog converters there. If you have an analog source, you also need an analog to digital converter. That means that you build a complete audio chain as soon as you decide, I want to build a good speaker. (laughs) (laughs) The good part was that we already had a lot of knowledge of converters and signal processing. And we had pretty good ideas about uh, what a loudspeaker should, be, how it should behave, uh, which is mainly related to the acoustics, of course, um, because, like I said, you're not just listening to the speaker; you're listening to the interaction of the speaker with the room. So mm-hmm. the, uh, the acoustic properties of the loudspeaker uh, are vital. And so we we started the design of that speaker from the, the acoustics only, and so one once the form factor of the speaker which has the, the biggest impact on the acoustics uh, was set. We build it up gradually from there. 